make no friends in the pits and you take no prisoners. No prison. One minute you're up half a million in soybeans and the next boom. Do Kids not go to attempt to adjust your device. The revolution starts now. Starts now. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Turn those machines back on! You are about to enter the halls of justice. Show me the money! If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. This is the Halls of Justice. Here are your hosts, Justice and Fat Man. Oh, good evening, everybody. Justice and the Fat Man with you. It is our regular edition. We had the bonus edition over the weekend, the regular one. Um, and so much to talk about, but mainly just in one big story that has just been dominating the news. Before we jump into it, let's say hi to our good friend, Fat Man. Good evening, my fellow Americans. I love every one of you. I just want, just want you to know, and look, it, I, I've said this before, and I feel bad that we have to deal with disclaimers, or at least I shouldn't even say we. This is just something I feel compelled to say. Because we have gone so far away from being adults, and, and honestly, guys, I think this is part a big part of our problem, is we can't have adult conversations because we want to go right to offended, and you can't say that. Man, guys, we, we have got to start being able to have real conversations, listen to each other's perspectives, and come to some sort of agreement on, on the topic that we're going to have tonight. So if you're not capable of processing... Um, ideas that may or may not agree with you and if you're not capable of processing concepts that there is actually blame and that there are two sides of a story and that no matter what side or what race or what background you are that you may be right and you may be wrong but a guarantee is you're not going to be a hundred percent of either one of those things so I hope you guys can sit back relax and enjoy this show and open your minds because we have to start having conversations and we have to start talking about things the way we're going to talk about it tonight. So uh, I hope you guys are capable of doing it. We're going in with an open mind and um, really want to share some ideas and some concepts. And uh, like I said, we hope this helps. And uh, this isn't to antagonize anybody um, on either side of this topic, but we have got to start having conversations like we're going to have tonight. So the big story over the uh, the last few days obviously comes out of Brooklyn Center, and that is the uh, the shooting of 20 year old uh, Dante Wright. Um, they identified the officer as Kim Potter. Um, she has since resigned uh, from her position in the uh, the Brooklyn Center Police Department. Not only did she resign, but the police chief Tim Gannon he resigned as well, and. If, if you're following this story, as soon as it broke, obviously they, they released the video very, very quickly. And what it appeared was that uh, they had run the license plate uh, of this young man, uh, of the vehicle he was in. I, I don't know if it was registered to him or not. I, I don't believe so. I think it was a family member, but the license plate uh, was expired. And, I think it was to his mom. Okay, so the, the license plate was expired, so they do a traffic stop on him. Um, they uh, get his identification, and then they check that. During the course of that, they find out, uh, obviously, he has some, some warrants that he needs to take care of. So they get him out of the car, and you see in the video, uh, at some point, he must have been told he was being placed under arrest because the main officer takes out his handcuffs. And, and then I believe he asked, well, what am I being arrested for? And then the female officer, Kim Potter, says, you have warrants out for you. And then there's a struggle. He he manages to get back in the car. You can hear her uh, yelling, I'm going to tase you. I'm going to tase you. And then what the police are trained to do is yell taser three times to let everybody around uh, them know uh, that the taser is about to be deployed. So you hear taser, taser, taser. And if you're watching the video, you could see she obviously has her handgun out in her right hand. She fires one shot. The car uh, leaves the, the immediate area and she yells, oh, S, I just shot him. Before we dive into this, let's let's do a little understanding of, of, of how the taser works. Um, so it's 50,000 volts, but the amperage is really low. So if you know anything about electricity, and I know very little, but I do know it's the amperage that kills you and not the actual voltage. So it's 50,000 volts, and what it does is it uh, incapacitates you for a short time. The average it, it, Taser's spec is once you pull the trigger, 
the taser will continue it'll deploy and it will discharge for five seconds on its own and then it will automatically stop unless the trigger is being continuously pulled or there's another pull of the trigger so there's five seconds when uh, during our research what we found is when officers are are trained in this and this is why i believe it was truly an accident uh, a horrific accident but i believe it was truly an accident so when you're trained with the taser you can only fire one shot and then you have to actually either change the cartridge on the end or you have got to uh, do some sort of selector switch i'm told so you, you get one shot when the officers are trained on their handguns they're trained to fire multiple rounds so the fact that she only fired one round indicates to me that she believed it was her taser the fact that she did all the protocol that we found is supposed to be followed with a taser leads me to believe that she thought that she was indeed uh, deploying the taser um, so there was two resignations and then the uh, the Brooklyn City manager Kurt Boganani he got fired. It, 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 so this is, I, I kind of have an issue on this. Th this is my issue is it appears the only reason he was fired, Fat Man, at least from what I can see, and I could be wrong, but at least from what I can see, is that when somebody asked him during a press conference if he believed the officer should be fired, he did not say she should be fired. He said that she should be given due process, whether you run somebody over with a car, whether you shoot somebody, whether you do anything, if it's on video, if, if it's blatantly clear that you, you've done some horrific act, you're still guaranteed due process. At the end of the day, if it works as it's supposed to, you will still face the penalty. But you are, we're a, a nation of, of law and in order to get this, you have to have due process no matter what. I mean, and then this guy was fired for that. Is is that the same? Is that what you're picking up? Yeah, that's that's exactly. And, and I was actually looking for more information on the structure of their city government. And it appears and what they're kind of, I don't know if it's spin is the fair word to say, but it seems like what they're saying is that that, that city manager was also somehow in charge of the police department. And they have now changed the police department to being under the purview of the mayor, which I thought almost all, if not all, um, municipalities were that way. But I guess there's always exceptions to the rule. So I had, I had heard, and again, I looked to see if we could find verification of that structure to their, to their city government where, uh, you know, and, and oftentimes you will see that in, in these shooting incidents that people above um, end up losing their jobs as well, or they resign or whatever it is. So uh, I, but I think that's a convenient excuse. I, I think it's absolutely because he said due process. And here's the thing. This is bedrock of the constitution. We have to have due process. Take this specific case out of it. And ironically, you and I have talked about this in just the last couple of weeks about regardless of what the crime is. And, and I'm sure you've seen it on your local news. I've seen it on mine. We've seen it on nationals. Crimes of, uh, of unspeakable things, anywhere from, from murders to things to children and just vile things. Every single one of those people have to have their due process. Because once you start making exceptions, where do you draw the line on exceptions? Well, we saw this video, so that person's guilty. Well, this person clearly did this because I saw it. The, the worst kind of evidence you can have is first-person evidence. I saw this, and especially when a lot of these trials happen downstream, years, you know, maybe a year or two before you have to remember exactly how you saw something. So we have to get back to that being where we start any case. As, as much as we hate the person who committed a crime, as much as we might despise them, we want them to, to be punished, uh, however you want to phrase it, they still have to be given due process. Because if we don't that, we don't have that, we have communism and we have the Soviet Union and we have Nazi Germany where people can just be convicted because somebody needs them to be gone. And we have got to maintain due process. And I say that in the case of anybody, no matter what crime they did, 
not just this specific case that we're talking about this evening. You have to be given due process. So I'm 100% on board with you. When a, when a government representative stands up and says, this person has to be given due process, the only thing I can say is, because that's exactly what they should say. Exactly what they should yeah. say. Yeah. Unlike things, you know, and we can get into this later, but, you know, you want government officials taking that sort of posture as opposed to what Talib said in, in reaction to this shooting. Um, somebody's got to lead the ship. Somebody's got to keep us calm. And you, you look to your governmental leaders to have that. And then this person apparently lost their job because they were calm and they showed leadership. I I agree. And every state has some sort of investigative bureau. Okay. So in Ohio, it's called uh, BCI Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Uh, not to be confused with the FBI or some other federal agency. So in Minnesota, it's called the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. And they had even advised Gannon to not release the footage so soon uh, that identified Parker as the officer. But, you know, there's a there's a line you have to fi- find between being totally transparent and releasing things too soon. Um, and they told him hold off on this. He didn't hold off on it. Everybody's seen the video now a, a million times. And now we're on three nights of riots out there, I believe, except for the fact. And they were called out by uh, Republican Texas Congressman Lance Gooden. Uh, CNN has not once said the word riot in the city after this. Uh, they keep referring it constantly as a protest and we clearly saw on night number one that it, it was not a protest. It was a riot. Once you start looting stores, we, and we talked about this in Portland, and we talked about this in other cities. Uh, once you start looting stores, committing crimes, breaking, just, just destroying property, lighting stuff on fire, then it's, it's no longer a protest, and you're hurting the people that are out there to protest for change. You're, you're, you're actually taking away from them. Again, you know, at least CNN is covering it. However, they, they refuse the, the whole protest thing. I got some other. Well, not, not, not to go off on a, on a tangent because of CNN, but I don't know if you saw the Project Veritas video that just came out this week about CNN. I mean, we, let's, just, let's just stop pretending that CNN is, a, is an actual news organization. All they are is a propaganda wing. Um, but Project Veritas just, you know, you know, Project Veritas, they're the guys that they go and they become part of organizations or they, they kind of um, befriend people in organizations. And they've done this in multiple organizations, CNN just being the latest. And they ended up talking to a technical director. Now, remembering back to my college days, a technical director kind of sits next to the director. And again, going back just to my limited TV experience, but the technical director makes sure that all of the... Um, character generated stuff is is put in at the right time and that type of stuff so it's not the actual director but you're fairly high up the food chain when you're when you're a td and but they got this this technical director and basically during the interview he's like oh no no question about it we were we did everything we could to get make sure trump didn't get reelected, and and you know we're gonna we're gonna carry biden through this through this term and we'll get them through somehow. But, and, it, and it's just it's, as somebody who has a journalism degree and spent time in broadcasting, uh, as you have, I still have a special place in my heart for who, what, where, when and why. And I still believe that if you are a journalist, we are commentators on what we do on this podcast. If, if you allow us to have that that title, um, it's different. You're here to, to give opinion. Um, but when you are a journalist, you are there to give facts, who, what, where, why and when. and um, CNN has, has been completely exposed multiple times for what they do, and now it's been exposed by somebody inside who was currently working at CNN that they're not a true nor- news organization, that just a propaganda wing. And now they are like a wounded animal because Trump is gone, and of course they, they wanted Trump gone, but be careful what you wish for because now Trump's gone, nobody cares, and nobody is tuning in to CNN. And so they're more than happy to perpetuate this. Um, this is this is something that we talked about 
uh, a couple of weeks ago about people getting along is bad for business. And I can assure you, race relations healing, this country healing, this country coming together as one again is bad for CNN's business. And they're well aware of it. And they're willing to do what we need to do to make sure that doesn't. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So when we delve into it a little bit more, so the protests are going on, the riots are going on, whatever you want to call it. I, uh, and I was watching it last night. It's probably both. I mean, there's there's legitimately people out there protesting because they feel this was wrong. Yeah. And they're entitled to feel that way. There's other people out there that are just there for mayhem and to get a new pair of Nikes. So here's here's what I watched last night. Uh, and this was just from people streaming it on, on Facebook Live <clears throat> while they were there. So you had a whole group of protesters. And then you had the police. And the police announced several times that, okay, uh, it, it, this is now an unlawful assembly. It's time to clear out. If you don't clear out, you're going to be arrested. If you interfere in arrest, then you'll be charged with something else. Anyway, but it, here, here's what I found was interesting was, it looked like this group, this main group, was in front of a couple of apartment complexes. And the people in the apartment complexes were actually coming out and yelling at these protesters to just go home. Uh, there's kids in here. There's, there's kids in here crying. And you're out here antagonizing the police. And it wasn't just one person. You could hear it every so often when they would get close enough to the building. Um, you know, the people yelling, just go home. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for, you know, protesting things that are wrong, but there's a point where you have to know that it's, it's time to call it a day and, uh, live to protest again another day. So I, I did a little digging here, uh, fat man about, uh, this officer, Kimberly Potter. Um, so she's got, before you, before you get to her, can I, can I just add one other thing to to what you were saying about uh, about those poor folks that live in in these neighborhoods, I will never forget. I mean, this is one of those ones that impacted me, and it, you've known me for thirty years, and I am well known for having a cold, dark heart, <laughs> and um, I only say that ten percent joking. Um, that that I call I, I call things in my entire life the way I see them, and some people don't don't respond well to that. But this one even. It just affected me when I saw it last year. Uh, it was an African-American woman. Uh, she was older. Uh, I mean, I would assume she was probably in her 60s or even later than that. And she lived in a uh, in a neighborhood that had just been rioted and looted, not protested, uh, where riots and looting went on. And she's sitting in a wheelchair. And that's how she got around. She She had to use a wheelchair. And she was there with a family member, maybe her daughter. But I remember her being interviewed and crying and saying, essentially, why did you do this? Why did you burn down this general dollar general? This is our neighborhood. This is my neighborhood. Why did you come here and burn down my dollar general? I, and this is the part that has stuck with me. I have nowhere to get groceries. That was my lifeline where I could get food and supplies that I needed. I don't have the, it's hard for me to even get on public transportation because she was in a wheelchair. And her one, in, in her community, they had burned it down. So the place where she was going to get her food and her groceries was now gone. And I know, you know probably in, in your neighborhood and in my specific neighborhood, um, you know, if one bur grocery store or a Dollar General or Family Dollar burned down, Within five minutes, I hop in my car and I'm, I'm to any one of them. So a lot of people might be saying, what's the problem with that? Just go to another store. I can also think of other parts of this community that I live in that if they burn down the one grocery store that's in that neighborhood, there wouldn't be one five minutes away or ten minutes away. And especially if you don't have a car, because we all think everybody has a car or two or three. She didn't. And these lower income, like so many of these stories we talked about, the lower income people are hurt even worse. Like we can look at it and go, man, that sucks. That's, uh, you know, somebody's business. But you're talking about somebody that doesn't have the ability to now go get groceries. And uh, I don't want to belabor this point and take up the whole show. But that that is something I will never forget that. I will never forget watching that poor lady just trying to understand 
why they had done this to her community. I, I've never understood that. Why would you burn down your own community when you're upset about something? I understand protesting. Heck, I even you know understand getting going to a point where you're so frustrated you almost get to the point of violence, or you almost get to the point of you know tearing down a street sign, or you know something along those lines, or or blocking a street where people can't get through. I understand that. There's sometimes when you just get so desperate, you've got to do something more than just hold a sign and walk down the sidewalk. But man, why destroy your own neighborhood? I, I just, I don't, I, I don't understand it. I don't. Yeah. Not to play devil's advocate, but you know, what they find a lot of times is the people that are doing this aren't even from that neighborhood. So, you know, that was exactly that woman's yeah. point. She goes, the people who did this weren't, didn't live right. here. And now this is what I've got to deal with. And, and like I said, I'll never forget her face and her crying. Because it th- that one thing that always strikes at my heart is when people, especially being the fat man, when people can't eat, when people can't get the simple thing of shelter and food. When I hear somebody like, I, I mean, I, I often donate to food shelters and things like that. Because that's just one thing that just, I, I just can't deal with the thought of um, somebody not having food. And now this woman wants to go buy her food. And she can't. And I'm sure there's people waking up right now in in uh, is it Brooklyn Center uh, and saying, where am I going to get my groceries today? But anyways, you had some stuff about the officer involved. Yeah. Uh, so it did some digging. It wasn't that hard to find out uh, that she's got 25 years experience um, and she is married to another police officer who works in a different Minnesota suburb. Uh, and she has two adult sons. That's really all the information I could find out about her. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure somebody else will do some digging. I don't know if she had any disciplines. I don't know if she had any pat on the back letters uh, other than just this brief information. I don't have. I had heard today that uh, she was a training officer and, in fact, was training a uh, a new officer on that very day. And apparently that officer is in the video as well. Um, and I think, and you know, you know, whenever you're ready, we should, I guess, start, start breaking this down because I think there's, there's multiple wrongs here. And I think they're, they're entirely two separate issues. And I think her level of expertise is really going to cause a major problem when it comes for her, um, her defense. Yeah. And but, it, it probably should. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, I, I think you can take probably out of that. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's almost like, um, you know, like an attorney, like they they have a or, uh, you know, they, any any expert in a particular field, you know, anytime you present a case in court, whether it's civil or criminal, they, they want to know your level of expertise because it goes up, you know, like not that this is anywhere close to what we're talking about. But like I've seen on people's court where an attorney will appear appear on the show, you know, and and the judge will be like, you're an attorney. My expectation of you is much higher than this lay person over here that doesn't understand the law. And I think she's going to run into that. But why, why don't we start a little bit with the front end of this you know, tragedy that happened? The, 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 the man, when he got pulled over, th- there's a lot going on there. Uh, I'm certainly not a police officer. I can't imagine doing the job. Um, I have family members who do it. I wish they wouldn't. I wish they would retire because I just can't imagine doing that job. And I'm not def- – this. don't take this as a defense of the officer. We're going to get to her in just a minute. But the expectations on police officers now, it's unrealistic. And I think we have to uh, – all this money that's being spent going here, there, and everywhere, I think on the police officer side, I think it starts with better training. You know, I, I've had members – you know, they go to the academy for, you know, X amount of weeks or whatever it is, and – Next thing you know, they're a police officer. And, that man, that, I just can't see that being enough training. And this doesn't mean you put all the blame on the police officer's shoulders. But they're, they police officers have to wear so many different hats during a day. One minute, they're helping a six-year-old who can't find her mommy at the park. Five minutes later, they're chasing somebody who just punched an old woman and robbed her purse. And five minutes after that, you know, they might be chasing a murderer. Or in a car chase. And then 10 minutes after that, again, they're helping somebody who, who can't find their dog. Like, how do you emotionally go from one transition to the next to the next? I used to be married to a nurse or two. <laughs> and they dealt with similar types of things. 
I don't mean to make light. Uh, it's just my nature. But they used to deal with similar kind of things. I remember one story my second wife told me when she came home, she, she was almost in tears because she, somebody she was on a heart uh, cardiac tour and somebody in one of the rooms had a cardiac event and, and coded. They died. So they get the crash cart out. She runs in there. You know, the, all the nurses jump in and they, they resuscitate this guy and they bring this guy back from the dead. Now he's alive. And she comes walking out of the room and she takes about five steps into the hallway. And here comes this woman out of another room. And she starts screaming at my then wife uh, because 20 minutes ago, she had asked her for a pair of pajamas because her husband's legs were chilly. And where were the damn pajamas? And she also wanted an extra blanket. And it's been 20 minutes and she hasn't gotten any of it. Now, me, my response would have been, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry your husband's legs were a little chilly, but I was busy trying to save someone's life. I know your blankie was more important than that, but... You know, she, she, of course, had to take the abuse and move on. And, and that's just an example of how, because a lot of professions deal with it, um, these types of things. But I just can't imagine the, the transition police officers make in a 12-hour shift or an 8-hour shift. Or sometimes they're doubling out and they're, they're overworked and they're, they're making $11 an hour or $9 an hour. Uh, some of these guys starting out in these, these departments that don't have money. Um, like I said, I didn't mean to go off on that, but I just can't imagine being a police officer and, and, and having to deal with all that type of stuff just because it's it's so like who, who is programmed to handle all of those things, all of those things. And you might, again, have five minutes and then you got to flip, flip a switch and you're into something else. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the beginning part of this um, this tragedy with him being pulled over. With Again, this is all we're still in the early stages. We don't have all the details, but this is what I'm kind of seeing in, in multiple media sources because I do try to, going back to that journalist background, I still go back and I try to get more than just one source to, to back this stuff. But it appears there was a registration issue. They got him out. There appears there was um, that he did have a warrant. The warrant was not for jaywalking, okay? Did a little digging on it, and and we'll wait to see what the final determination was. But apparently he, he was attempting to rob a, quote, friend, of her rent money, $820, and uh, he did it at the point of a gun. Now, this isn't to, to make the, you know, this is all the, um, uh, the you know, bl- victim shaming or victim blaming. This is just to give you an idea what the police officers, because generally they would know that information. You know, they would, they would pull this person out, and they, they would know this information as they approach the car. Um, maybe they even had interactions with him before. Um, so. They may have already been on high alert, and then he made the biggest mistake of his life. He started to resist. If he never, and again, this is not victim blaming. This is reporting of the facts. They're different things. And if you don't understand it, you're on the wrong program. The facts are he started struggling. He started fighting. They knew they had a person with a violent string a violent part of him if he wouldn't have done that if he would have just been cuffed he would have went to jail and he would still be alive today now we can move on eventually to the the officers because she's got to pay her price too but unfortunately this young man paid with his life but he made the choice i've heard it on many shows is uh, and i heard it i don't even know who said it today but he he was on one of the the news talk shows and he basically echoed exactly what you said um, and said, look, you know, I know you don't like it. And if the officer is wrong, you know, then you you cuff up and then you come back and we sue them and you get your revenge that way. In, instead of, you know, I hate to say it, but you're taking your life in your own hands when you start resisting. So, you know, there there was... If everybody involved could go back in time, I'm sure they would make different decisions, and hopefully that young man would still be alive today. Some of the things that have fallen out from this that I've heard people say, though, are just ludicrous. Um, And I've got a sound clip here I would like to pull up. This is the mayor of Brooklyn Center, Mike Elliott, I want you to listen to this. 
I'm not going to tell you what he's about to say, but I want you to listen to this and then tell me what you think. The full text of, okay. of, of, of your request uh, and uh, make sure that, you know, we sit down and, and, and go through it and, and see how we can implement. Uh, I, I don't believe that officers need to necessarily uh, have weapons, uh, you know, uh, every time they, they're, they're making a, a traffic stop. Wait, did you hear that? I don't think they need weapons every time they make a traffic stop. Right. I don't this this don't the statistics say that that is the most dangerous thing a police officer can do is a traffic stop or or is that, I guess that the first thing would be a, a domestic. Yeah, I, I think those are, are are one and two. But yeah, how you know I feel for that town, but I feel for the police department as well having this guy say that if you have a police department or you're a police officer the job is inherently dangerous and this guy's telling them that we don't need weapons at every traffic stop so let's you know let's let's think about that okay we don't need weapons at every traffic stop batman tell me which ones we need weapons at and tell me how i know if I'm a police officer and I make a stop, how do I know it fits into that category before I make a stop? <laughs> there's no there's no sensible answer to that question. There just isn't because, you know, you know, look, I, I'm a I'm a CCW possession or I have I have a license to carry. Um, I have my gun with me almost 24 seven. I have additional weapons uh, in my vehicle. And the the thing. The, the old adage we always we always say you know it's it's better to need it or it's better to have it or have it and not need it than need it and not have yeah. it so what are you supposed to do if you're a police officer go up to the window and when you're greeted by the barrel of a gun go whoa 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 time out the rules of the game here are i got to go back to my cruiser and i'm going to get my gun and then i'll come back up you just hold your gun there. Make sure yours is loaded because mine's going to be loaded. And then we'll kind of shoot it out to make it a fair fight. I mean, that that's not that's not the way you, like, like, you know, growing up, my parents didn't when they were trying to teach me something and I did something wrong and I needed to be disciplined. They didn't go for a push. They didn't go for a tie. They they wanted to punish me in the nature that, you know, I'm not talking they hit me with a baseball bat, but whether I got a spank on the bottom, whether I had to go to my room for the whole day, whether I couldn't wasn't allowed to go play for a week, whatever it was, you had they had to have the upper hand. I had to somebody has to be in the power position in that relationship. A police officer, and this is gonna, you know, tie into the officer that did the shooting, but the police officer has the burden of being the person in the power position. With that power comes great responsibility. So this isn't let the police off the hook because they're the power person. It's the exact opposite. They have taken on the responsibility of being able to walk around in public fully armed, and they need to be that way because they need to be prepared. Just like I was saying before, one minute you can be looking for a lost six-year-old boy, and the next minute you can be in a gunfight, and the next minute you can be chasing down a robber. Yeah. The, the, it, you know, All of these things can happen. So... The, <laughs> I mean, this is the this is the preposterous stuff that comes out when people are pandering. And this is what, guys, the, the disclaimer I started with the show with, only half joking, this is what I'm talking about. People are pandering and just trying to come up with phrases to, to so, so people who hear it go, yeah, yeah, exactly. Police shouldn't have guns. We need to have more social workers out there. You know, look, I... I, I think social workers are great. They do great work. But if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and my car's broken down on a dark road and a car pulls up behind me and two guys get out of it and they've got ski masks on, man, I sure hope the car coming in the other direction is a police officer and not a social worker. And, you know, come up with any any kind of scenario you want. I just I, – these types of things, Tlaib with her defund the police, we got to completely get rid of them. It, incarceration. No, we're we're going to get to that. <laughs> we're we're better than this. We we're just we are all of us. All of us. I don't care what your skin color is. I never do. I don't care what where you were born. I don't care what your ethnicity is. I don't care what your height, your weight. I, I don't care anything about. All I care about is, is your character. If you're a good person, 
The, that's the people we're appealing to right now. We have got to be better than this, and we can't listen to stupidity like what this man is spewing. Yeah, so I just did a quick uh, Google search, and he says that police officers shouldn't have guns at traffic stops. Already in 2021, there have been 15 police officers killed during traffic stops with a firearm. So you can't say, you know, I don't know how to put this any more clearly than I believe that some things need to change. I believe that there should be more training, but I don't believe the solution is taking away the tools that the person you call to solve the problem might have to use to solve the problem. So that was an ignorant statement uh, on his part. And you, you briefly, uh, you mentioned uh, Tlaib. Uh, Wait, so hang on one second. That wasn't an ignorant statement. And, and I'm not trying to play word games here with you. That wasn't an ignorant statement. And, and, and an ignorant statement means he, he, he wasn't educated on it. He didn't understand it. He didn't know what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was saying, and he did it, and he didn't care who it, who it harmed. So before we get into Tlaib, I, I just want to do one, one quick thing, just ask you something. Um, have okay. you heard the name Joshua? Sorry, Locke? it doesn't ring a bell to me. Well, let me tell you why that is, because there has been wall-to-wall coverage of what happened in Minneapolis, and in, in the Minneapolis area, um, and it, and you know we've been talking about it at length, and of course it, it's tragic on so many different levels. But there was also another tragedy, an intentional tragedy that's getting almost no play. Um, Thirty seconds on this network, forty-five seconds on that network. Joshua Law is a police officer in. Burleson, and that's in Texas. And the other day, he or I'm sorry, yesterday he pulled up to um, a red light, and a gentleman by the name of Jerry Don Elders fired multiple shots into the police car in an ambush attack with only one thing in mind, killing that police officer. Miracle upon miracle, the man was shot. The officer was shot in the neck. He, uh, they, they think he was shot at this point at, um, three times. Um, but he survived. They said if, the, if the, one of the wounds through the neck had been a through-and-through through shot, he would have died. Um, but somehow it did not go all the way through. And, uh, again, amazingly enough, that, that officer is, is going to survive. Sadly... Apparently, the, the three men who committed this attack um, had killed a woman during the commission of their mini crime spree. So that's just a quick example of how fast we learned Dante Wright's name and how long it takes to know this police officer's name. And and, and again, I, I'm not making any correlation between blame and responsibilities. I'm making this more of a commentary, again, on the media. And as grotesque as this statement is, it's been said in newsrooms around the country, if not around the world, if it bleeds, it leads. And the Dante Wright is figuratively and um, legitimately it bleeds, and that's what gets all the coverage on any network. CNN, Fox, NBC, ABC, they're all over it because it gets ratings. A police officer being ambushed in Texas, eh, hey, this happened. Okay, back to back to this where the, the riots are going on. So um, it's just sad that uh, something like that gets almost no coverage, and it happens far more than we are ever exposed to. Hey, we're going to talk about Tlaib here, but what do you say uh, 
we go ahead and take about a 30 to uh, yeah, let's break do here. That. You are listening to The Halls of Justice. If you would like to be a guest, have a comment, or a show idea, then send us an email at justice at hallsofjustice.com. Halls of Justice is a weekly podcast, and you can always find our latest episodes listed on our webpage at www.hallsofjustice.com. Or to look for us on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Help us grow and spread the word. Please share with your friends. Now, back to more exciting entertainment on the Halls of Justice. Well, welcome back to the show. Justice and the Fat Man with you. Before we jump into this, I have to say, there probably won't be a video today because hopefully if I do my job right, you won't hear the edit, but we've been having some network difficulties tonight and the video that we record uh, is broken up, so I'm, I'm, I'm doubtful on any video this week, um, but uh, we'll, we'll go on. Our tech team, which is you, yeah. is, is so genius, so so incredibly talented at what they do. You could actually be a Hollywood celebrity like Chelsea Handler. You know who she is? I do know who she is. Okay, so a lot of people have heard heard of her. She had a, a network show for a while, and she's a comedian. Here's just a quick, uh, again, this, this just adds ridiculous fuel to fire. And I love when people this stupid are called out. Chelsea Handler said, why would any person of color ever comply with a police officer when there is a 50-50 shot of getting, quote, accidentally, end quote, shot. Because if you comply, there's like almost a 100% shot, 100% chance that you don't get shot. Well, because she's way better looking and way smarter than you, Tommy Laren, she actually had a, a, a similar comeback to Chelsea. Hey, genius, every single one of these tragedies stems from noncompliance. If you really cared about people of color, you wouldn't encourage them to resist arrest. And again, this isn't an attempt to put the blame back on Dante Wright. It's a it's an attempt to illustrate that we have got to get back to facts. Dante Wright resisted arrest, and then the police officer shot him. If he doesn't arrest, or if he doesn't resist arrest, we never get this. Now, again, don't you dare start with your victim shaming, your vi- victim blaming. I'm a one thousand percent not doing that. I'm telling you what happened, what I saw with my own eyes on the video, that if that man would have allowed himself to be put in handcuffs, he'd have gone in the back of a police car and he would have gone to the police station unless there would have been a reason to release him on the spot, which it doesn't sound like there would have been. But he decided to arrest, and then the second part of it is the police officer shot and killed him. And she's going to have to answer for that, and she should answer for that because everything, and again, we'll wait till all the facts come out, and we'll wait till this plays out downstream, and see all of the facts associated. But we all saw the video, and we all heard her say, taser, taser, taser. And even if she didn't intend to shoot him, she took the man's life. Mm-hmm. So they're two, they're two entirely separate incidents. He made a huge mistake, and she made a huge mistake. And we can dissect both of those, because if we're adults, and we can have honest conversations, and we're really looking for solutions we can have that conversation. If you're not looking for a solution, if you're only looking for a reason to steal Nike and to riot, then you're, you're just going to call me every ist in the book. You're going to call me this, and you're going to call me that, and you're going to say, I, it, because you don't, you don't have any interest in solving problems. You only have an interest in being, being a victim. And you know that's a perfect example of the, the Hollywood elite where they sit in their you know, gated communities. They have security guards. A private security, all that kind of stuff at their, but they're willing to say, Hey, these folks that live in, in poor neighborhoods and I don't care whether it's white, black, Hispanic, Asian, you know, whatever, whatever you're, you, the people who live in these neighborhoods, they're the ones that need police. They need police more than people do in these ultra rich neighborhoods that, you know, the, the biggest crime they ever, the, the crime spree and where, where Chelsea Handler lives is, is jaywalking. So I did, I did some you know, research because yeah. when they, uh, I don't know if I should lead with this or if I should just... Uh, so, how easy do you think it is to mistake your taser for your sidearm? Do you think it's happened in the past? Well, as I mentioned to you, I I um, have some family members who are police officers, um, and I've actually seen one, and I've, I've had it in my hand. What's, what's odd about the design of the taser is, and I guess it makes it easier to deploy it, 
it it kind of feels like a gun in your hand. And look, I have I have multiple firearms. I have something a small 380 that that's really light, and I have a 357 with a I don't know. It's it, I think it's a 10 inch barrel on it, and it looks almost like a rifle. It's and that thing that thing's got to weigh several pounds. I guess ultimately, you know, I, those two extremes I would know, but I also have a nine millimeter. And if I grabbed a nine millimeter, I don't know if in a second or two I would realize which one I had in my hand. You, you know what I mean? So I guess there's there's certain, put it this way. I would say the the window is open that somebody could have honestly have made that mistake, especially in a high pressure situation where the adrenaline's flowing and whatnot. Doesn't forgive it, but I think it's certainly plausible. Eighteen times in the last twenty years, it's happened. Okay. So I think it falls into so, that. It's plausible, but it's, you know. And the last fatality, I believe, was in 2018. Uh, and it was like a, a reserve officer or a part-time officer. I forget what it was. But he was an older gentleman. And he mistakenly grabbed his ta- or his, his gun when he thought he had his taser. And he shot a fleeing suspect. Uh, he was sentenced, I think, to four or five years in prison, but only ended up doing uh, like 18 months, I think it was. And I think that was just due to his advanced age. But, you know, the the family is still suing him. And, you know, I guess rightfully so. Um, but I guess the point is people like Tlaib, who says that this wasn't an accident, uh, this shows that it was. And I, I want to read. I want to get into this. <clears throat> this is what she said. She said it wasn't an accident. Policing in our country is inherently and intentionally racist. Dante Wright was met with aggression and violence. I am done with those who condone government-funded murder, no more policing, incarceration, and militarization. It can't be reformed. So if I take that at face value, she wants no more police Right. I mean, I I guess if somebody's breaking into your house and you call a neighbor or a friend because she doesn't believe in any more police. And I believe every sentence in that is incorrect. Take away people's ability to feel safe, to feel protected. And, you know, and this is I think the last stat that I saw and, and believe it or not, some of these statistics are hard to find. You would think some of these would be readily available, but some of this takes a lot of research. But I, I believe I saw in, in uh, I, think, I think the year was 2018, and it showed that nine, nine, nine um, African Americans who were unarmed were killed by police. As we've discussed on the show before, one is too many, regardless of race. One person mm-hmm. accidentally killed or intentionally killed or shot by a police officer is one too many. Statistically, again, this is where we got to have adult conversations. Statistically, the number of people killed, unarmed people killed by police is ridiculously low. Again, how many times do I have to say it? One is too many. But the interactions with police between all people, the, the statistics, um, it, it would be point zero 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 and a whole bunch of zeros. Um, where, where these kinds of things happen. And even in some of those where there were nine unarmed people shot, they were, there, there, were, there, was all, there were also other circumstances, fleeing or trying to get away or, or, or whatever. So, again, I'm not blaming somebody. You, you don't have a weapon. You, you know, you know, there's, there's no way that, that you should be you know, facing down the barrel of a gun. But um, we have I don't know if you stop can stop saying these dumb things. I, I'm, I'm hearing audio, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you could see it. This is just for me and you, but it's day four of the riots. Oh yeah, uh, it's 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 going on again as we're, even as we're doing this show. Um, and and here's the thing: we can get into so many different aspects of this. But I sent you something earlier. So they are ready. Uh, have found this female officer guilty, and and and, and nothing short of being. Uh, taken out and and I don't know punished in public is going to do for or at this point. But it was just announced today that the police officer in that fatal shooting on Insurrection Day, the police officer that fatally shot Ashley Babbitt, is not going to face any charges. And here's something that was done 
intentionally. So, and I know even if I said to you at the time, I go that this isn't the same as it's not apples to apples, but you have an accidental discharge in one incident and you have an on purpose in the other. And I don't understand that, um, that that person still took a life. I, I, I don't I don't know where to go with this. <laughs> it's almost like it did, they're, they're treating that almost like it it's didn't happen. And here's here's my perspective on this, too, why I, I have such problems dealing with with people who don't look at things logically. The police officer, the um, congressional police officer that that shot that woman, I don't care what race she was. I don't care what race the police officer was. All I care is somebody is dead. Now, look, you couldn't. I, I don't know if you've ever toured the Capitol. I have. I've, I've been there. I've not been in the White House or the, the, the congressional building, but I have been there. Yeah, so I toured it, um, and I was able to, able to actually go in the chamber, the House chamber, and sit up in the gallery and that kind of thing. Um, and you, you got to turn in your cell phone. You go through metal detectors, you know, the whole nine yards. That is a place that you just know when you go into it, you don't want to screw around. Kind of like when you go through airport security, you don't want to be like, hey, guys, don't forget to check my suitcase. I got a bomb in it. You know, you just know you don't want to play around in certain areas. Congress, the halls of Congress is one of those areas. So, look, to a certain degree, just like I said with Dante Wright, she went into that building. Now, again, I'm not victim blaming. But she made the decision to go into that building and bang on those doors. I personally never would have done it. I would have outside. I would have been there. I wasn't, but I would have been there. I would have never gone inside that building. You go inside that building and you're asking for trouble. I'm not saying you're asking to get shot, but things are going to happen. Just like when Dante started the fight and the, the, you know, he started the fire and then the fire burned and those neither one of those people deserved what they got. Um, I don't understand how there isn't some sort of um, punishment for that officer. But, you know, not to get into the insurgency thing too much, but we haven't heard much about that, have we? We still no. haven't heard how some of those officers died. Um, the one that they said originally was hit by a fire extinguisher apparently wasn't. So there's there's a lot of, quote, interesting things about that. Um, and maybe that's a, a show for another day or a topic for another show. But it, it's just it, it, these things that Tlaib is saying, the Hollywood left is saying, that the, the mayors of the city saying. How how can they not get rid of her? I mean, she is obviously a mean, hateful person who is counter everything America is. I mean, how if Trump had said something like that, uh, if you spin it that way. Then he would have been peached again. You know, I was going to actually do that tonight, and I didn't get a chance to write it because my real job took over. Um, but I was going to pull up some quotes that I had found, and I was going to say, hey, here's some quotes I found that came out of Donald Trump's mouth. And I was going to pull quotes like that and illustrate the double standard that you get in this, this hate speech. That's exactly what it is. She it, wants to keep is. violence and hate going. By making those statements, it solves nothing. I thought they were supposed to be the party to bring people together, but all they have proven, and, and it really is kind of pissing me off, all they have proven this whole week is they want to keep driving that wedge in between people. Absolutely. And get the firearm, get, you know, get firearms out of uh, law-abiding citizens' hands and make us hate each other. That's that's. Yeah. It, that, that's the goal. What else could it be? What else could yeah. it possibly be? Yeah. I mean, so we are, we're, we're starting to come to the end of the show here. So I want to make some things clear. Uh, we've said this many times. You said it. I am so sorry for the family of that young man that lost 20 his life. years old. It should, thing. it should have never happened. I am completely on your side there. I am completely on your side that the training at that police department needs change. I, I am 100% with you. We're not blaming anybody uh, for this. I, I guess I'm. I, I guess I'm blaming the officer because she should have known better. Um, I didn't know she was a field training officer, and I didn't know she had 25 years experience before today. She sh- she should have known better. So you she's know, she's going to pay the price for that. She will. But I, I agree. She is entitled to her due process. The investigation has to take place 
It has to be thorough. It has to be complete. And then she gets to go to court just like that young man would have got to go to court. She gets to go to court and, you know, whatever they decide she will have to face. She's done. Her life is over. I mean, she's not dead. Granted, uh, you know, there's people that's going to compare that, but her life is over as well. So many people's lives got destroyed that day, and so many families got uh, destroyed that day. Um, you know, I'm sorry for everybody involved. As you said, one life is too many. It, uh, it, it, it's a case of um, people made mistakes, and this time it cost people lives. Dante made a mistake she made a huge mistake and again the the burden on her to to perform to a certain level like if this were this were a rookie officer obviously it'd be just as tragic but you know you, you can understand maybe a, a rookie officer but with that type of experience you know even the officers around her in the video are, there's like a frozen look on their faces like you said you know you can you can have an accident you can have a tragedy you can have all of this um empathy for the situation that went on, but also, and this is how adults approach things, you can be empathetic to what that officer and her family are going to go through. You can be empathetic to uh, Dante's family and the fact that he is not going to go up and, and see his life. And you can also be empathetic to the people whose businesses and homes are being looted and ransacked and, and ruined. But you can also look at the facts. The facts are she made that mistake of pulling her gun. There, there are some safeguards in place. So that doesn't happen. She should have known better and she didn't. And she's going to have to pay the price and be judged by her peers. Dante made a terrible mistake and it ended up costing him his life. Again, not his fault, but he made a mistake. And, you know, sometimes we make mistakes and it ends up in terrible tragedies like this, but you don't take a tragedy that's already going to ruin two families and ruin 50 more or 100 more by burning businesses down, taking away the only grocery store that a neighborhood has. This, this doesn't help. Guys, we, we have got to stop falling victim to the Talibs, to some of the hosts on Fox, to some of the hosts on CNN, to some other government officials. We have got to stop falling victim to them because that's what we are. We're allowing them to make us the victims of their hate. They want us hating each other. I don't hate any of you guys. There are some people I hate in life. And you know, sometimes people wear that as a fact. I don't hate anybody. I hate, there's people I hate. And I know them. I know why I hate them. I know exactly why I hate them. And, and if they dropped over in front of me, I wouldn't. And they were on fire, I wouldn't piss on them to put them out. Okay? But strangers I've never met, I don't hate anybody that I, that I don't know. You give me a reason, I'm going to hate you. But we have got to stop hating each other just because somebody in Congress tells us we should just because somebody wears a badge and somebody else wears a hoodie because the melanin in your skin, we have got to start listening to each other. And the, the thing that gives me some hope justice is there when I'm out in public and I run into somebody the other day, I was going in the grocery store and I, uh, you know, I think I might even told you this story came up to the grocery store and I kind of cut in front of this African American woman. And she kind of looked over to me like, almost, what are you doing? Well, I cut in front of her so I could grab the door and open it for her. And as soon as I opened the door, she looked at me and smiled. She goes, you have a nice day, sir. I said, you too, ma'am. That's America. That's who we are, Justice. Not what we're seeing on Fox and on CNN and, and in Congress and in the White House. That's who we are. American people are a lot closer and a lot more e pluribus unum than our government and our media is allowing us to know. Yeah. Pay more attention to your individual interactions. Pay more attention to how you live your life than what some government official is telling you the rest of the, the country looks like. Because they're they're wrong. They're the ones that are screwed up. That's because it's not good for business for the, uh, the media people. It's not good for business. How pathetic is that? So I think to play us out today. Hey, wait, before you get to that, um, I, I know we're really late on time, but I... I went to my phone and I did that Bluetooth we talked about in the last show. The Bluetooth hookup worked mm -hmm. perfectly. Also, I, I, my one car does have the apps. Works perfectly. Folks, we're, I'm going to try to do some videos that show you how to sign on with an app in your car, how to use Bluetooth. Because one thing, I, until I started doing a podcast with you, 
I had I, I was the same way. I was like, I don't know how to listen to a podcast. What does that even mean? Like, do I have to stand on my roof with my my house with one foot in the air and and twinkle around? That's how I pick up a podcast. I had no idea. I was totally intimidated by it. But now yeah. that I've done it, it's super easy. I'm going to try to do some videos to show you how easy it is to actually listen in the car, listen at home, listen at the office, that kind of stuff. And I just want to point out, and people, I'm sure they get this. This show is audio. The video that we're toying with and playing with here and there, that's secondary. Um, if it never works right, then I don't care. <laughs> but it, it, the the audio and the podcast, because most people have time to listen to something as they're driving down the road, as opposed if we only posted video, they would actually have to sit somewhere and watch it. So And seeing us is not pleasant. No, <laughs> no. You, 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 that you is really... not going to be the highlight of your day. <laughs> You really don't want to see us anyway. <laughs> I don't know. When I smile, I'm kind of cute. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I need to. I, I, I'm going to. I'm going to see the doctor tomorrow. It's a new glasses. Actually, I am going tomorrow. I'm, uh, I guess I'm going to get the jab tomorrow. Nice. So, Number this one. Might be my last show. Yeah, that won't be the first time you got the jab. <laughs> yeah. Might, next time I do this, it might be third eye blind. Uh, All righty. Good night, America. We'll see you next week on the Halls of Justice. Be good, folks. The Halls of Justice. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. If you have a show idea, would like to be a guest, or just want to communicate with a show, email us at hallsofjustice at roadrunner.com. You can also find us on Facebook. Tell all your friends. And we'll see you for a new episode next week of the Halls of Justice.